Welcome to this debate among candidates for the New Jersey Legislature. The candidates here tonight are seeking election to represent citizens living in the 16th District. This forum is co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters of the Princeton area, the Princeton Community TV, and the allprinceton.com, that is Princeton's news and information hub. My name is Barbara Trout. One of the qualifiers for me to moderate to here tonight is that I live outside the 16th district and therefore cannot vote for these candidates. I'll be voting in District 8. To keep the forum as fair as possible for the candidates and for you, the League has established guidelines. We will begin with opening statements from the candidates and following the two-minute statements, we will proceed to a question and answer segment. The questions for the candidates have been coming in from you and they are being collected by League members. The timekeeper is Lee Forbes, seated in the front row, and she will hold up cards that uh, indicate time remaining for a candidate. Lee, a yellow card is 30 seconds? It's 15 seconds. On the alert there, 15 seconds. And a red card means you've come to the end of the time. <coughs> After the opening statements, where the order for, for the, the uh, sequence has been established by the flip of a coin. I will then direct a question to the first candidate in each party, and there'll be 90 seconds to respond, and we'll go through a rotation of questions and fair time for every candidate here. When the time for the questions and answers has elapsed, there'll be closing statements, up to two minutes for each candidate, and that will allow them to make their points as you weigh your choices. The candidates are seated by political party. So on your left, starting at the center, Marie Vella. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it is, that's why. <laughs> Maureen Vella, who is running for state senate. And the two running mates for the Office of General Assembly, Marie Corfield. And, and Joe Camarota. The Republicans here tonight are Christopher Bateman for Senate. Jack Cittarelli for the General Assembly. Very good. When, when you see your ballot, there will be a second candidate, a Republican, for the Assembly. That gentleman's name is Peter Biondi. Mr. Biondi had a death in the family and was not able to be with us here tonight. So that said, let's begin with the opening statements, and as I said, the league leaders have done some flipping of coins, and we're going to begin with the Republicans, and first the Assembly candidate, Mr. Cittarelli. Good evening. My name is Jack Cittarelli, and I'm seeking election to the State Assembly in New Jersey's newly configured 16th Legislative District, which covers four counties and 15 towns. I'm a lifelong resident of the region, Born in Somerville, raised in the borough of Raritan, where I served two terms on the town council, and for the past 14 years, living in Hillsborough Township, where my wife has been an officer in the Home and School Association, and I've coached our four children in various recreational activities. I earned my bachelor's and my MBA at Seton Hall University, where I've taught as an adjunct professor. I've practiced as a CPA. I'm a successful entrepreneur and business owner, serving as a publisher for a Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Journal. For the past five years, I've had the privilege of serving Somerset County citizens as freeholder, winning the support of Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. As a fellow taxpayer, I'm proud to say that my votes and achievements as freeholder have always matched my words, and my record proves it. I seek the office of Assemblyman for three reasons primarily. First, 
We are in desperate need of leadership today, leadership that is honest, independent, principled, and determined, the type of leadership Senator Kip Bateman and Assemblyman Biondi have provided. Second, nationwide, there is a fundamental assessment taking place at every level of government as to its size and its cost. I want very much to participate in that dialogue on behalf of the citizens of the 16th Legislative District. Third, there remains a property tax crisis in New Jersey. I have specific ideas on how to solve it and hope that we'll discuss that tonight. I congratulate my running mates and my opponents on their candidacies. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters of the Princeton area for sponsoring this forum and for e-archiving its videotaping, thereby making it available to the greatest possible audience. Thank you all for attending. I look forward to a very candid and constructive dialogue on the issues facing New Jersey. The candidate for the assembly from the Democrats, Joe Camarado. Good evening, everyone. First, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this event and Ms. Trout for being moderator. You've always you've done a great job and uh, look forward to a, a good evening. Um, I also want to thank the audience tonight for coming out. Uh, your participation is uh, greatly needed and immensely appreciated. Thank you. Again, my name is Joe Camerata. Uh, I am married to my well lovely wife, Charlotte, in the crowd out there. <laughs> I also have three children and four lovely grandchildren. I've been a resident of South Brunswick Township for the last 22 years. The last seven of those years, I've had the privilege and honor of representing the, the good people of South Brunswick by serving on the Township Council. And last month, with great pride, Money Magazine named South Brunswick Township the 22nd best small town in the country, something we're very proud of. I'm also a small business owner. My partner and I have been together for 38 years. We're currently based in East Brunswick, New Jersey. And throughout my adult life, I've been involved in many different and <coughs> civic organizations. Uh, I'm currently the uh, president of the Board of Trustees of Women Aware, which is a group dedicated to the eradication of domestic violence. I also am a VFW auxiliary member, and one of my greatest loves, I'm still coaching, now I'm coaching my uh, grandson in traveling soccer. And actually we won the state cup last year, so another something that we're very proud of. <laughs> I, I bring up those different uh, entities because municipalities, small businesses, and civic groups have allowed me to work with Trenton in many different capacities. And what I find is that Trenton is broken. There's a real disconnect with Trenton. And we need to change that. We need to change the culture of that. We need to send people to Trenton that will focus on the middle class and real property tax relief. We need to create jobs. Thank you and we much. need to focus on ethics reform. And hopefully tonight we'll be able to discuss those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Democrat for the Assembly, Ms. Corfield. We only have, we only have one microphone. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Don't start her to use her microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this event tonight. I would also like to thank the audience for your participation and your questions. I'd also like to thank my family for um, for dealing with all of this for the past few months. Um, I'm a single mother. I have a son who's in his second year at Monmouth University, and I have a daughter who's in middle school. I'm a lifelong resident of New Jersey, and I have a BFA in uh, commercial art from Montclair State, and I have a master's in teaching from Mary Grove College in Detroit. And I moved to Hunterdon County about 15 years ago, and I love it there. Uh, but I've, I've, I'm not, I have not always been a teacher. I am currently a teacher now. I have not always been. Um, my very first day of teaching ever was September 11th, 2001. And that day taught me a powerful lesson. There were hundreds of police, fire, and rescue workers who made the ultimate sacrifice that day. They ran into burning buildings willingly and gave their lives so that others could live. And they, along with others who were fortunate enough to survive, 
were hailed as heroes, and rightly so, by every person in this country, and they deserved every bit of our gratitude and praise. And here we are, 10 years later, just having passed the 10th anniversary of that day, and those very same people, along with teachers, hospital workers, and other public employees are being called, are being demonized. And I would like to change that. I want to go to, to Trenton to fight for the middle class, to fight to keep this state strong, to fight to keep the backbone of this state functioning, which is the middle class. Thank you. Make sure the moderator has the flipping of the coin results correct. The candidate for state senate representing the Republican Party, Mr. Bateman. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good evening, and I also would like to thank the League of Women Voters. This is really democracy in action. And I would like to thank all of you for taking time out of your schedules to come here tonight. I am uh, Running for re-election, I've been in the Senate for four years. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Branchburg Township, where I've lived uh, there for almost just last weekend, actually, uh, 54 years. I've been married for 27 years. I have four children. Actually, my lovely wife, Sue, is here with us this evening. I'm a lawyer by trade. Uh, prior to running for the state legislature, I had the opportunity to serve all Somerset County as a freeholder, one year as director, one year as deputy director. Prior to that, I had an opportunity to to represent Branchburg Township at the Township Committee level as mayor and Township Committeeman. I have <clears throat> worked in, for the past two years with Governor Christie because uh, I, like you, love living in New Jersey, but New Jersey is becoming a state that is not affordable. And I have four children. I'd love to see my children grow up here, live here, and hopefully someday, not too soon, see grandchildren. But the way uh, we're paying taxes, we need to continue the fiscal discipline in Trenton. I think you've seen a big change in the last 20 months with Governor Christie uh, in Trenton. For the first time, we've had, the last two years, we've had actual budgets worth $3 billion less than the last Corzine budget. We need to have the fiscal discipline to spend within our means. And I have uh, worked closely with the governor on some key initiatives regarding the budget, as well as some other key legislation as far as the pension and health care reform. I hope to get into the issues uh, this evening because I think there is a contrast. I think that most New Jerseyans do see a difference in what's going on in the state. And I'd like to continue to represent the 16th district. It is a whole new uh, challenge um, having the Princetons and South Brunswick and part of Hunter County. I have represented Somerset County and Montgomery, so I'm not unfamiliar with some of the issues, but I look forward to uh, answering some questions. And again, I thank you all for coming out. and the Democratic candidate for Senate, Maureen Vela. Good evening, my name is Maureen Vela, and I am your candidate for New Jersey State Senate in the 16th District. First, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters. Since 1920, they have been engaging in bringing women into the political process, and this has been improving government. And as a woman running, I really appreciate that, so thank you. There's three things I would like you to know about me throughout this debate tonight. I set my standards high. I never get discouraged, and I always strive to do my personal best. I'm a lifelong resident of the state of New Jersey, and I've lived in Hillsborough for 13 years. I am a graduate of Rutgers University, and I graduated law school from Southwestern University in California. I came home from California, got married, and I have three children. I love being a mom, and I love being a business owner and an attorney. Every day, I listen to people coming to my office because for 27 years I've been practicing law, but for 25 of them I've been on my own as a matrimonial and a bankruptcy attorney. And when they come to me, they come to me and talk to me about their loss of jobs, loss of incomes, and they're losing their houses. Since the beginning of this campaign, for five months, I've been out talking to people at their doors. And guess what I've heard? The same things. People are hurting. So I'd like to take my skills as an accredited professional mediator and a certified collaborative lawyer and use these skills. And that's just legalese for saying, what I do is I know how to resolve issues peacefully. 
without creating conflict. And those are the skills that I want to take to Trenton. What I'm looking to do is to go to Trenton to resolve issues and to resolve conflicts and change the direction that we're going in. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to move to the next section, and we can do a lot of questions and get a lot of responses if you all hold back your applause. So you've greeted them. You have good candidates. So let's see where we go with the questions. Here's a question that's directed uh, generally, but there is an order that's been worked out by the flipping of a coin, different coin maybe. So I'm going to start with uh, Ms. Corfield, Mr. Cittarelli, and Mr. Camerata. And the question is this. Now that the Council on Affordable Housing, COA, no longer exists, how would you ensure that municipalities provide sorely needed housing for New Jersey citizens? We'll start with Ms. Corfield. Sorry. Well, the Council on Affordable Housing was fraught with problems. It was a broken system didn't work properly. That being said, we have to make sure that our towns have, have the ability to provide housing not just for some, but for all. We have to make sure that the laws that are written for tenants and landlords are fair. We have to make sure that the laws regarding development and zoning don't cut out one group of people in favor of another. We have to make sure that property taxes are affordable so that all people can live where they would like to live. There's not an easy answer to this. And it's taken a long time to get to this place. But I have, I have confidence that we're going to go down there and fix the problems so that people have a place to live and that no one has to go without a home. Thank you. Uh, timekeeper, 90 seconds. Okay, she just reached the 90 second. It's up to 90 seconds. It's up to 90 seconds. Okay, all right. We ready to begin again, Mr. Cittarelli? Yeah, as I understand, the elimination of the Council of Affordable Housing doesn't necessarily overturn the landmark Supreme Court ruling referred to as Mount Laurel. Um, Municipalities still have their obligation to provide a certain element of affordable housing. I personally see affordable housing as an economic development opportunity, especially in our cities. And I think our planning boards and our zoning boards are very, very mindful of that obligation. Certainly times like these help out. When you have an economy such as this, the McMansions all of a sudden become a lot less attractive and you're seeing more and more 55 and older communities and affordable housing because those are the type of homes that are moving in the real estate market. So. Again, the elimination of the council was more to get rid of a lot of the red tape. That doesn't erase a landmark ruling uh, looked upon by many courts throughout our nation as a standard bearer for how to provide housing for those that can't afford the three, four, five hundred thousand dollar homes. There are still rulings like builder's remedies. We've just had one recently in Hillsborough Township that's going to uh, allow for the construction of 700 homes all of which at the lower end of the market. So the elimination of the council was about eliminating a lot of bureaucracy, red tape, and saving tax dollars. It doesn't change the landmark Supreme Court Mount Laurel ruling. Mr. Camerata. Just going to start again. Yeah, wait, you ready? It's your time. Okay, okay thank you. Um, that is an excellent question. Uh, I've had the uh, privilege over the last six years serving on the Affordable Housing Committee in South Brunswick. We've seen the different gyrations and uh, formulas that were proposed by the uh, Co of Affordable Housing, and quite frankly, they've gone from one extreme to the other. But it still remains the issue at hand is how do we uh, uh, create affordable housing? And it's even become even more egregious as Arlene's sitting there, and I know you've done a great job with it, Arlene, one of the best in the state. But what's happening now, and something we have to address, is that the current affordable housing industry in, in New Jersey has gotten to the point where the values of their homes are stipulated by the state. Now, those values, with the recent 
de decline in the market values are very close. So you're looking at houses now with restrictions based on their affordable housing status that are very close to the open market and fair value homes. So that open, that, that affordable housing used to have hundreds and thousands of people waiting for are now not selling because people rather buy affordable homes at the market rate. So that's, that, that, that's a, a secondary issue that's happened. But what we have to do is this, this, this was not, even though ACOA was eliminated, it still was switched to a different department. We have to find ways to work with developers, public and private entities that will develop affordable homes for our residents in, in uh, New Jersey. That is needed and we will accomplish that. The next question goes to a different subject <coughs> of two different people. This is uh, on charter schools and there's a reference to a bill that has been entered in the assembly. My question is going to the Senate candidates. The question relates to uh, a bill that would require voter approval before charter schools could open in unwelcoming communities. Please say yes or no on how you would vote on this and explain it, please. And I'm going to begin with Mr. Bateman. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. First of all, um, I think charter schools play a very important role in the educational uh, system in New Jersey. However, I do think that it, it does sometimes conflict with our public schools, and I think that there should be uh, voter approval, approval in the towns uh, before they allow to come in. I, I know the governor is pushing it. I think charter schools play a significant role, especially in uh, districts that are failing. I think that um, parents should have the options. I think parents should have the choice. However, because they are receiving 90 percent funding, I think that the, the municipalities in which they are being located should have a say. So I would support that legislation, yes. And Ms. Vela. The answer also is yes. I do believe that we need to have a, a say. There should be voter approval. And I, I think that voter approval should not only be in the towns, but we should look beyond that. If these schools are going to impact larger districts, we may have to take a step back and just see how much of an impact the charter schools are going to have in the neighboring towns. We can't just look at what's happening in, in that one area because this is, there's got to be a lot of accountability. And when you start putting in charter schools, it affects a lot of people. We have good education here, and we need to take a look at how this is going to change. We can't be rushing into this, but we certainly have to have the community input. We need to be open, transparent, and we need to continue along the lines of always being accountable. And so, yes, nothing should happen without community approval. Thank you. Let's move to a different subject. We had all that flooding this summer and all those rivers that got out of their banks. There's a program that's been introduced that's being referred to as Blue Acres, where New Jersey municipalities could use open space monies to buy out homeowners who live in flood plain areas. That's a part of it, and then, you know, how would you limit or control building in these areas in the future? So we begin this time with Mr. Cittarelli. Uh, I support the Blue Acres program. In fact, I personally, as a freeholder, after Irene, where Brown Brook and Manville were ravaged by flooding. Uh, Bound Brook's flooding wasn't as bad as it's been in the past because it is at the near end of a more than $100 million Army Corps of Engineers project. Um, Manville is where Bound Brook was 30 years ago. So we have a public policy decision to make. Should we spend $100 million to build a project to protect Manville the way we're now seem able to protect Bound Brook? Or do we use that money and couple it with Blue Acres policy to buy out homeowners? I think the good news is we have more people in Manville now interested in selling their homes than after we did with the Nor'easter of five years ago and after Floyd back in 98. I think that's a very, very positive development. I do think that in many ways uh, these type of projects, like beach restoration, there's an old saying, you can't stop Mother Nature. And what used to be called the 500-year flood became the 100-year flood in Somerset County has now become the three-time flood in the past 13 years. So we have a very important public policy decision to make in terms of how we invest public funds. I support Blue Acres. I've advocated for it fervently in what is referred to as Lost Valley in Manville. And thankfully, we have more people than ever before interested in taking advantage of the program. Mr. Camerata. Thank you. I absolutely support this program, and I think it's a good example 
or the bipartisan approach that the Assembly and Senate can take down in Trenton, that's very rare these days. <clears throat> this is something that um, open space we're very proud of in South Brunswick. We have a great track record of it. We've acquired over 2,000 acres over the last decade. The money is there. There's a, there is a set formula for it, and that is the key thing here. There is, a, there is funding available. It's not like we have to establish any new funding mechanisms to support this program. You know, if it acts like a duck, looks like a duck, it is a duck. And these areas that are flooding need to be leveled off and become open space. We can't keep continuing to reinvest in properties that are just going to have a flood, as Mr. Chiarelli just said, instead of every 100 years, maybe every 10 years, every five years. We, you react to the stimuli, you react to the situation, and you come up with solutions. This is a good solution to a problem that affects so many people and so many homes. I you know, support it wholeheartedly. Thank you. Ms. Corbett. Well, it's nice to see all of us here at the panel agreeing on something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, and it's, a good, it's, it's a good policy. I mean, I grew up in Kearney. I, um, I grew up watching Willowbrook Mall flood, Lincoln Park flood, and back 30 years ago, they wanted to, the Army Corps of Engineers was talking about building, you know, just reconfiguring the Passaic River. And as Mr. Cittarelli said, you know, you can't fool Mother Nature. Um, and water seeks its level, and water's going to have its way. And I, I read in the papers, and, and back then, they were talking about a buyout program for the people in those areas. And, and just reading the papers after Hurricane Irene, there were some people in those flooded areas that this is the second or third time that they're living through this and their stories were heartbreaking. We cannot continue to throw good money after bad in trying to, you know, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And we keep doing that and we're not getting a different result. So I think this buyout program, the Blue Acres program, is an excellent one and I fully support it. Another one that relates to the environment, but this time it's broader and more general. And these, this question is going to go to the candidates for Senate. Do you support Resolution SCR 239 that declares a proposed rule by the Department of Environmental Protection to allow the waiver of certain rules and regulations to be inconsistent with legislative intent? There is a comment built into the question, and I trust our candidates to go with it. Ms. Vela. Could you repeat the question, please? Sure. This is in reference to a proposed rule that the DEP would allow the waiver of certain rules and regulations to perhaps be different from what the legislative intent of the uh, underlying legislation was? Okay. My answer is yes, I do support this rule. When it comes to the Environmental Protection Agency, we should be very clear that what we do to protect the state of New Jersey, we have to look at carefully. We have such great resources here, and they need protection. And when you're dealing with standards between the EPA and what's going on in the state of New Jersey, we have to be very, very careful. We have policies and procedures, and to, to turn around and to waive what's going on by the EPA rule means that we can have more stringent rulings and really watch the standards of what's happening. Now, <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Bateman. Yes, I, I actually uh, have voted for this. I support the waiver rule, and I think that the whole subject of flooding points exactly why we need to the, the, allow the commissioner to have this uh, leeway, because uh, during the latest hurricane, Irene, uh, the commissioner was allowed to waive certain rules to get in to help people, in particular in my district, in Manville and Bowen Brook. If he didn't have that authority, there were many things that could not be done right away. And so when you're in a, a natural disaster, the commissioner has to have the opportunity and I think the, the discretion to be able to waive some of the rules because um, to help individuals, especially in, in, in life, uh, life uh, threatening situations. So I did support that. I think that the commissioner, uh, if he uses that, uh, rule properly, I think it's in the best interest of the general public, so I do support that. Our next question takes us to an entirely different subject, women's health. It appears that women's health issues are the first item on the chopping block when it comes 
to balancing the budget. How would you prioritize this issue? The question go to assembly candidates, starting with Ms. Kornfeld. I think women's health has to be a priority for people in this state um, and, and, and Trenton because healthy babies start with healthy mothers. And, and I was very sad to see the, um, the cuts that were made to women's health clinics in the current budget. Um, I, I would gather that most of us, I would gather that all of us in this room have access to a car we can drive to our doctor's office. But the women who were affected by the closing of those clinics, um, I would gather that there's a good chance that they don't have cars. So it, it's not as easy for them to get to one of the other clinics that remained open. A healthy society is a productive society. A healthy, a healthy population is better able to contribute. It costs less to um, they are, they are less of a, of a financial drain on society. So I think that cuts to women's health um, not only hurt the individual woman, but they hurt society in the long run. Mr. Cittarelli. You know, Madam Oper uh, Moderator, I'd, uh, I don't know how the questions became phrased as they were, but I, I take exception with it, its phraseology in the sense that uh, women's health issues are the first thing on the chopping block. Um, I think there's educational constituents who would disagree. I think there's, in light of the fact that two of our psychiatric hospitals are being closed in New Jersey, that constituency would disagree. I was at a Princeton Museum recently that had its funding cut uh, by the state, and that constituency disagrees. Um, I think that, um, you know, what's gotten a lot of play is the fact that in light of the, the, the most recent state budget, six clinics were closed that provides, provide women health, uh, take care to uh, women's health. And what you don't hear is that there were 58 such clinics around the state. So six have now closed, which means there are 52 that remain, which is about two and a half per county. And in our most densely populated counties, there are, th there are at least three women health clinics still operating. Uh, this is a different time and era. Everything is on the table. No decision is easy. People are out of work. Public sector workforces have been downsized. Um, it's a different time and era. And I think every constituency is doing its very best to deal with the hand that it's been dealt. I know the state is doing the best it can with the hand that's been dealt in terms of our economics. Mr. Camarado. Thank you. As a Democrat, and one of the reasons I am a Democrat is I believe in the core philosophies of that, and one of the, the staples of that is to protect the most vulnerable. This cut went after the most vulnerable, and that's a disgrace. Whenever you have a program that is funded with dollars locally, meaning the state of New Jersey, that the federal government will reimburse nine to one, does not make any sense whatsoever to cut a program that you will have nine to one. Why anybody would even vote for that is beyond my imagination. We need to f focus on women's health because, the, as, as my running mate said, it affects the people that can't travel two counties over to get aid or help. That's the key, to make it accessible for the people that are most touch. And as a president, again, of a, of a group that focuses on domestic violence, a woman can't go sometimes and get a bus to go from here 100 miles away to get help. That's wrong, and we need to service those people and be there for those people. And me and my running mates will be there if we were sent to Trenton. Thank you. A new subject again. Now, a, let's hold it. Let's get as many questions as we can. And this is another new subject. This one's going to go to the senatorial candidates. And the subject is fracking. What is your position on fracking? And I'm going to assume we all know the definition. The, letter, the question writer gave the definition. What is your position on fracking? Do you think it's safe for New Jersey? Do you agree with Governor Christie's one-year moratorium on this issue? And we begin with Mr. Bateman. Well, that's perfect because I'm the co-sponsor of legislation that would ban frac frac fracking in New Jersey. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> I had trouble getting that one out, didn't I? Uh, 
I am very concerned about the impact that fracking could have on the contamination of groundwater, in particular Delaware River. So I was co-sponsor with Senator Gordon of the legislation that would put a moratorium on fracking. And actually, it's interesting because I, as I walked in, somebody handed me today the New Jersey Environmental Federation. They had endorsed me. And one of the reasons they endorsed me was because I sponsored the ban, uh, the bill to ban fracking um, because it's I think it has great potential to damage our environment. So I will do whatever I can. I've had a conversation with governor's council. I've not had a conversation with the governor. I haven't had an opportunity to see him. He's been busy le of late. But um, <laughs> I want to see what I want to see what Senator Gordon wants to do because I don't think one year moratorium, as some of you may know, our bill would prohibit um, uh, the process of fracking. Which, if anybody doesn't know, <clears throat> what happens is they use high pressure water to break into the shale and uh, to, to, to release the, the natural gas. The problem is in doing that, they use chemicals with the high pressure water. And what happens is it comes out and it gets into the groundwater and there's been contamination around the country. It's a bad bill for, the, I mean, it's a bad practice for the environment. I'll do whatever I can to convince the governor to put a moratorium indefinitely on it. Thank you. Ms. Rella. I also believe that we should have a ban on frank fracking, and I believe <laughs> it's, a difficult, it's a difficult word, but I believe that this ban <clears throat> should stay in place at least through the year 2014. And the reason for that is because the EPA is now conducting a study about fracking. And that study has to be completed. We have to know all of the facts. Our governor only wants a one-year moratorium right now. One year is not long enough. I am an environmentalist. I call myself that because I live on a, on a small farm. I have, I raise Highland cattle. They're the red animals with long hair and they're grass fed beef, but, but their water, their drinking water is important. We get our water from the well. What happens when the water is contaminated, water comes out, you can light it on fire. This is something that we have to watch out because we have a lot of wells in the state of New Jersey and we have to protect our water. So environmental issues are so important. We have to make the environment our priority. Thank you. Many of you tonight are going to be uh, experiencing District 16 for the first time. And there's a question here with you in mind. This is going to go to our assembly candidates. Non-residents of Princeton and with Princeton a new addition to your district, how do you believe you can best represent your new constituents? So it goes to Mr. Cittarelli first. I, I see the 15 towns uh, that cross-section four different counties as having more in common than uh, indifference. And I think anyone who seeks public office knows that no matter how big or small their community, there are different constituencies in that community, and you shouldn't be seeking office unless you feel confident that you'll represent all of them equally well. So I can tell you that in Somerset County, 21 towns, 325,000 people, we have towns that are very, very different. But I feel over the course of my five years, my track record reveals that I've represented all equally, despite their disparaging interests. So I'm confident in seeking this office that of these 15 towns spread out over four counties of these 200,000 plus people that I can do my very best and make them proud in the way that I represent them. Mr. Camerato. The 16th district in terms of Princeton, that was the question, right? Part of it, okay. Yeah. Well, that, that's actually an easy one for me. Um, being in South Brunswick and being on the Township Council for, for seven years, for the last seven years, I don't know if I can mention her name, but a young lady to the right of me, one, two, three, <laughs> serves on the uh, Kingston uh, Village uh, Association, and I've been, have the honor of serving on that as the council liaison. And the Kingston Village services Princeton area. So I'm fully aware of a lot of the issues concerning Princeton. Uh, I've been in Princeton, uh, again, being so close to South Brunswick, a lot of the Princeton and South Brunswick issues are very similar. As are, you know, when you go up to Hunterton and you go up to um, Somerset, you know, the focus is going to be the same. You have property tax problems. We have jobs, creation of jobs, and we have ethics reform. Those problems coexist in every one of these towns. They have the same problems. So, 
when you're sitting here and you're saying you're going to represent the people, that's the difference. Because you want to go down to Trenton and not go down there representing or following a special interest group. You want to go down there and be able to represent and speak and be the voice of every resident in the 16th district. And I know me and my running mates will do that if given the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Corfield. Since mid-June, I've had the pleasure of walking and knocking on doors in the 16th district, and I've gotten to know a lot of people. Um, and I see a lot of familiar faces in the room tonight. And many of you have my home phone number, because when I've walked and you weren't home, I left my card with my home phone number on it. And that's the kind of legislator I want to be. That's the kind of representative I want to be. Um, you, uh, Princeton has uh, a, a strong history of having um, solid representation in Trenton. And I know that because of the redistricting, you are losing that representation. And I've made it a point to reach out to as many citizens in this town as possible uh, to introduce myself, to tell you about myself, and I want to be that kind of legislator, not only for Princeton, but for the rest of the 16th district. Um, I want to have an open door with my constituents. I have walked this town and seen some incredibly beautiful homes. I have seen some very charming and quaint middle-class homes, and I have seen some very poor neighborhoods. This town is very culturally diverse, it's very socioeconomically diverse, and that's one of the things that I enjoy, and that I look forward to serving, to serving all of the people, not just a few. Thank you. Our next question goes to the candidates for Senate and it relates to pension for state workers. Do you believe the recent suspension of cost of living adjustments for public employee retirees who have given years of service to the public is fair? Would you actively fight to have the COA restored? And we start this time with Ms. Vela. Thank you. Let me first read to you. This is the New Jersey Constitution. Article 1, Section 19. Pensions and private employment, uh, persons in private employment shall have the right to organize and bargain collectively. Persons in public employment shall have the right to organize, present to, and make known to the state or any of its political subdivisions or agencies their grievances and proposals through representatives of their own choosing. It's in our Constitution. We have certain rights. I explained to you that I'm a mediator. I explained to you that I believe in due process. You can't change the rules in the middle of the game. It's not how it should be done. This is not what I, what I stand for, and it's not what we should be standing for. What happened with the pensions and with the COLA is that was put in, in with a bill with, with the health care. First of all, these two bills should have been split. They needed to be separate. And when they would have been separated, you would have had the unions coming to the table and negotiating. And this is what they wanted to do. They wanted to negotiate, which they have the right to do. <clears throat> and they wanted to come and, and bargain for themselves. And this is one of the reasons why I want to go to Trenton and bring the skills that I have there. We can't be doing away with collective bargaining, and we can't be doing away with these skills. Thank you. Mr. Bateman. Thank you very much. The fact is, they didn't want to negotiate. Uh, I supported the pension reform uh, bill because, quite frankly, the state is broke. And um, we're trying to preserve the pensions for the people who deserve it. And the people who have put their lifetime in is public employment. If we didn't take drastic action, there wouldn't be a pension system. And in a perfect world, you're right. I, I, I want to see them get fully funded. And maybe someday, if, if the economy turns around, we'll be able to reinstate the COA. But with the reforms that happened this year, we're saving $120 billion over the next 30 years with the pension and over $3 billion in the next 10 years in the health care. We just don't have the money. And, you know, sure, there's an, ob there's an obligation and there's a constitution. But there's also an obligation to the taxpayers of the state of New Jersey. If the money's not there, what do we do? And there have been many mistakes made in the past by both Republicans and Democrats. And I, I'm the first one to point out that the governors in the past should have made the full pension payment. If we had, we wouldn't be in this problem. But the problem is they didn't do it. And if I was governor, I would have done it. But I, unfortunately, I was in that position. And it was both Republicans and Democrats. So we were forced with an issue 
How do we deal with a system that's going to go broke for the, for the, for the teachers and the firemen and the police officers who have de, 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 excuse me, dedicated their life to serving the public? They're entitled to a pension. And so we did the best we could, I think, considering the facts that the, the system was going to go broke. And I, you know, I support it, and I'll support the governor's efforts to continue to get this state back on a sound fiscal track. Thank you. We move to, honestly, hold up, and we'll get plenty of time for applause at the end. Lots of questions here. This is one on transportation. Transportation funding for 2012 continues to favor expanding roads and highways, which often leads to low density auto oriented development in suburban areas. Mass, mass transit in already developed areas can lead to urban revitalization. Do you see a role for legislature in developing mass transit? Be specific, please. And we start with Ms. Corfield. Well, I definitely see that um, le the legislature can play a very important role in transportation. Um, I, was, I was very sorry to see that the, um, that the tunnel didn't go through. Um, having lived up in Hudson County and worked in New York for several years, uh, I know what a struggle it is for, um, for commuters to get in and out of the city. And even if you're not a commuter, it's still a struggle. And we, you know, we, we have to give those people an opportunity to, to have a comfortable commute. Um, our, our infrastructure, our roads, our bridges going in and out of the city are in, in terrible repair. And we can't keep, the more people move out to the suburbs, it's, it's, it's bringing down our cities also. So um, not only do we need to, um, to invest in the infrastructure, in the cities, but we also need to keep our roads, our bridges, um, our highways in the suburbs at peak condition. Um, and I was, you know, I was sorry to see that um, that the transportation trust fund is so low on funds that we don't have the resources to um, to make these kind of improvements because it could go a long way in um, providing jobs to a lot of people. Mr. Chitterelli. There sounds like a contradiction in her answer in the sense that you can't develop a transportation system that gets people to New York City, but then develop our cities. I support the governor's cancellation of the ARC project, and I'll tell you why. If New Jersey was going to spend $3 billion, $3 billion along with all the federal monies, to help people get into Manhattan, where they buy their newspaper, where they buy their bagel, where they buy their lunch, where they buy their dinner if they work late, where they buy a gift for their spouse if it's an anniversary or, part or a birthday, that's all economic stimulus for New York City. I say we take the $3 billion, revitalize our cities, create jobs in New York City, so in my Hillsborough suburb, my three neighbors don't have to commute into New York City. Their commute right now is two hours, door to door. With the Arc Tunnel, it was one and a half. What they said to me is, Jack, do me a favor. Create a job for me in New Jersey so I don't have to commute into New York City. So how do we do that? First and foremost, with the best infrastructure system in the country. This is a very densely populated state. We need to get people to want to live and work in our cities. That won't happen unless there's a first-class transportation system that supports our cities. New York's not going anywhere, gang. It is the economic and international capital of the world. But that $3 billion is better spent right here in New Jersey, shortening people's commutes, which increases their quality of life. Mr. Camerata. Could you repeat the question? Yes. I, I, this I refers to the answer. transportation funding and the writer says it favors expanding roads and highways, which often leads to low-density, auto-oriented development in suburban areas. Mass transit in already developed areas can lead to urban revitalization. Do you see a role for the legislature? Okay, that, that's what I thought the question was. I don't know how we got sidetracked, but um, <laughs> mass transit is obviously a key. Again, we talked about this before. You got, you know, close to 9 million people in this state. We don't need all those vehicles on the car, but we, I mean, on this car, <laughs> we don't need those vehicles on the street. But what has happened is that our infrastructure is weakening. It is in repair, especially after the harsh winters that we've had, you know, in recent history. How do we correct that? Well, there's really only, there's only two ways that I know of. One is to raise the gasoline tax, which I will never support. So what else can we do? Well, there's, there's things called public and private partnerships 
things again with my experience in municipal government and also in private business, we need to focus on those type of entities. Because people will and companies will invest in the infrastructure because it is a proven commodity. People are going to continue to be able to get from one place to the other in New Jersey. And we need to provide that. We need to make sure our bridge are, bridges are safe, our roads are safe. That's critical because we do have, I mean, again, in, in South Brunswick where I live, we have 100,000 people go through Route 1 every day. We need to make sure that, that road maintains the highest degree of safety because the most important thing of any elected official is the safe health and welfare of every resident. And that's something we have to focus on. We have to find a way. We've got to be creative. And that's what we will do when we're in Trenton. Thank you. We're going to move now to our candidates for the Senate. And this one, um, you know, when we ask for questions to come in on cards, we're trying to make sure you were not making your own speeches. But some of these have speeches built in, <laughs> and in order to give you the background, I have to do the speech. So that's the deal. <clears throat> With Governor Christie about to complete the record year, his second year in office, the governor's fundamental position on balancing the budget has been to oppose the millionaire's tax because it would drive businesses and people away. As a result of the governor's position, the burden has been shifted to the middle class and the disenfranchised. If elected to the 16th district, would you support or oppose the millionaire's tax? And how is your position related to the social contract of we the people? Beginning with Mr. Bateman. <laughs> we the people, okay. Well, I oppose any increased taxes and actually, um, for the second time in two years, I've been endorsed by the taxpayers. I, I, I've been named the taxpayer champion because I have a 100% uh, scorecard on, on taxes. I don't think uh, the millionaire's tax is going to help our economy at all. I, um, I was just in Somerville two days ago. We had an opening up a shop right, uh, 235 jobs uh, coming to Somerville. And that was an initiative that came about because um, the local officials ShopRite, we worked with EDA, we worked the governor's office to try to cut down some of the red tape to try to uh, provide incentives through financing to bring businesses here. And then we were very successful in bringing it to Somerville. What's been happening over the last 22 months is under the lieutenant governor's leadership and Governor Christie's leadership, they have been working with corporations and businesses around the state to try to give them incentives to try to talk to them on how we can become a business friendly state. For years, New Jersey was closed for business. Under uh, the Corzine administration and prior to that, uh, businesses were fleeing New Jersey in records uh, every year. Um, th this governor um, has tried to make that a priority because if we have businesses here, we have jobs here. If businesses expand, jobs expand. And just raising the tax on the millionaires is not the solution because we don't want businesses, we don't want people to leave New Jersey. We want, make, we want to make it affordable for them to stay here and, and provide jobs. So I, I, I oppose the millionaire's tax for Ms. those Bella. reasons. Ms. Bella. <clears throat> right now, we have an unemployment rate in the state of New Jersey at 9.4%. Where are all of the jobs? We were told that if this tax, the millionaire's tax, and it's not to put a new tax on, we're actually taking a tax that, that was on the millionaires, so it's reinstituting something. But we were told that if we did that, it was two to three years ago, that all the, the wealthy people would leave the state of New Jersey, so we can't do it, because we need them here. It's going to create jobs. Where are they? Those jobs didn't come about. I've never, we ha haven't had this kind of unemployment rate. You have 16,000 people who earn over a million dollars in the state of New Jersey. Each one of them is getting a $40,000 tax break. That amounts to almost $500 million. That would help us. That would help us tremendously. We need to all share the sacrifice, not just the poor, not just the middle class, and we're feeling it, but we need the wealthy in this state to share as well. Every day when I have been going out and meeting people, they're telling me, there, there, there are 30, 40, and 50-year-old men that I've met during the day, and they're out of jobs. So no, we need to institute the millionaire's tax. 
go to ask a more general question. What, in your view, is the most important function of the New Jersey legislature, and where do you think it's done a good job? What specific areas do you think it could do better? I'm going to start with Mr. Titarelli. I think any state legislature can do better. I think there's a great many politicians. I certainly don't feel this way about my running mates because they've always been front and center, but there's a great many elected officials, uh, whether it's in Congress in Washington or in state legislatures, that can kind of hide in the obscurity that the institution provides and um, forget that it's all about representing the people, not about themselves. We seem to, uh, to live in a, a very uh, celebrity conscious society where politicians are always constantly referred to as dignitaries and celebrities. Here's the way I look at it. If you're a registered voter, you hold the highest office in the land. And if you're one of the registered voters in the 16th, I report to you. So I think on an individual basis, we need to hold our elected officials more accountable. I think on the whole, what legislatures and Congress needs to do more than anything is work together, is work together. I think we've all had it, have we not? And um, I know this. I own a company of 25, uh, 25 employees. I've got an executive leadership team. I can exercise my executive privilege, but if we don't all work together, it doesn't work. My wife and I have four children. We're outnumbered, but uh, we all have to work together or it doesn't work. And I think more than anything, that's what we expect of our Congress and our state legislatures. Good, bad, or indifferent with the policy, but at least work together. Mr. Camerato. <clears throat> Thank you. Trenton. What comes to your mind when you think of Trenton? What comes to my mind is disconnect, apathy, not getting the job done, property tax. Look at that issue alone. We've been going back and forth on that every year, every year. It's the same thing. Pension reform, health reform, all the same issues. We, you know, Fortunately, we have moved in some of those areas, but not to the degree that we need to. Too many of our people that are down in Trenton today, and actually also in Washington, look at this as a job. They capitulate to their leaders and vote in blocks and platforms. We need people who have independent bipartisan thought that will be able to go to Trenton and Washington and represent, that's the key word, represent their constituents by going out and talking to them, listening to them, and then going and voting based on what their needs are, not the, based on what you need to do to keep your job in Trenton or Washington. That's where I think the disconnect is. I'd like to see more independent, bipartisan thought down there and some action, and I think that can be done. We just need to change that culture. Thank you. Ms. Crowfield. Sorry. That's okay. <clears throat> I agree with both of the gentlemen who just answered the question. Um, I agree with Mr. Cittarelli in that government's role is to serve all the people, is to be a voice for the people. And I agree with my running mate, Joe, in that the system that we have right now in Trenton is broken. Um, I, I look at government and the, the position that I hope to hold as someone who can do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. That's what I have always expected of my elected officials. And right now, Trenton is not doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people. The greatest number of people in this state, the middle class, the poor, women, children, seniors, are being left out of the economic recovery equation and instead being forced to bear the brunt of this recovery on their backs. And that is not right. But we do need to work together. We need to check our egos at the door. We need to check our political interests at the door. We need to roll up our sleeves, sit down at the same table, and work out solutions that will benefit the greatest number of people. Then we'll go to what seems like a constituent question, but I think there's policy in here, so trust me, we're gonna get to it. Um, it starts out asking about Verizon, so it sounds like something for the BUP, the Board of Public Utilities, right, BPU. Verizon is the largest telephone utility in the state and thus subject to oversight. Verizon has stopped maintaining its copper wire phone infrastructure. For those elderly and low income, 
service interruptions are a regular occurrence. Verizon's answer is to purchase more expensive alternatives, such as Fios. Does the state have a role in protecting these consumers? What can be done to reinvigorate an ineffective consumer advocate? And we start with Ms. Vela. When we're dealing with large corporations, we have to watch what they're doing with, with their employees and what they're doing with their employees and what their in turn their oversight is and then what in turn happens to the people. When big business affects the elderly and big business affects lower income families, there's a problem. We're not just supposed to look to the big business and say, you're in here, you're creating jobs, you're good. It's more than that. We need to look at the results. This is a balancing test. This is one of those times when there's no right answer and no wrong answer. But you're going to have to look. What's happening to the people? And then you take a look. What's going on with the business? Because when companies come in and they want to start leaving because we're going to start regulating or over-regulating or telling them what to do and how to do it, it, there's a problem. When we step in and say we are the oversight, there's a problem. And at the same time, when we let them go and just do what they want and, and take over and, and don't regulate the businesses and don't actually tell them that, hey, this is going to affect us, the citizens here in New Jersey, there's a problem too. So this is one of those times when you have to get all of the facts and address it and not forget about the people. And Mr. Bateman. Thank you. Yes, the state does have a role in those issues. Uh, First of all, I do agree that it sounds like a constituent issue, and if they call my, if they live in the 16th district and they call my legislative office, we will look into it. But that's why you have BPU, and also in addition to BPU, uh, you have the AA, double, I'm sorry, AARP, who's a very, very vocal lobby group in Trenton, and they, they protect their seniors. And when issues such as these come up, they get involved. But yeah, the, the, the responsibility of the legislature is to insert influence on the BPU in cases like that. And my office has done it for many years. We've helped constituents out, especially senior citizens, citizens who sometimes are taken advantage of. But yes, the state does have a role through their legislature, through their legislator or through the BPU or through their, their lobby group. But it's, it's definitely an issue that um, can be addressed. Thank you. And now a general question that has to do with how you prepare to be a legislator. And once you're on that job, how do you spend your time? How important do you think it is for a legislator to read and understand a bill before signing on as a sponsor? And start with Ms. Carnfield. Corfield. Corfield. <laughs> Everybody mispronounces it. Well, especially if you're going to be a sponsor of the bill, especially if you, you know, you have to know what's in it. Um, I, I really don't know what else to say about that. If you're going to sponsor a bill, you better know what's in it. Um, but as far as being prepared in, you know what, can I, oh, I don't know if I can ask if she can repeat the question when I'm in the middle of answering it. But there was a part there that you were talking about just, just overall preparedness I assume, I think that was part of the answer. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you obviously, I have to be aware of the issues. Um, I, I subscribe to the Star-Ledger and read that almost cover to cover every day, but I also read online the New York Times, the Washington Post, um, Politicker, Politics NJ, and any and all links that people send me, and they send them to me nonstop. So I read papers in Seattle, I read papers everywhere. And, and it's important to be obviously aware of the issues not only at the state level but at the national level because what's going on in other states affects us. But, um, you know, I don't really think there's any more I need to say. You got to know what's in the bill if you're going to sponsor it. Mr. Cittarelli. Yeah, the, the, the question suggests that there are those that sign on to bills or maybe even vote on them who haven't read them. And uh, that would be, if that's the case, a very, very sad commentary. I think it's the kind of thing where uh, people lose their hope in government. And um, I give people my word, there's few promises I make. 
Um, but uh, I promise the constituents of the 16th district that I'm the sponsor of the bill, and even if I'm not, if I'm voting on a bill, I'll read the bill, I'll know what the bill contains. And if I don't, I'll stand up on the floor and say this body hasn't given its legislator ample time to analyze this bill. Um, you know, the devil's always in the details. And I think we can all imagine there's probably very, very few bills. I have no experience to draw upon because I haven't been in this legislature. But there's probably very, very few bills that are one or two pages. And I can tell you, as someone who's practiced as a CPA, there's very few pages in the IRS tax code that are one or two paragraphs. And you can't advise people on tax policy unless you've read the code. I read the code. I got tired of reading the code. That's why I no longer practice as a CPA. <laughs> And uh, if you hire a CPA, you deserve to have one that's love and read in love with reading the code. Um, so I, I think that which best prepares anyone to serve is having a very diverse background, um, a rich background in, in many different types of experiences. That's what best prepares you. And more than anything else, humility, which my parents always taught me was the most important of virtues. Mr. Camerata. <clears throat> Thank you. A quick answer would be, uh, obviously, I share the same thoughts as my colleagues, uh, yes. Um, in that regard, uh, being uh, the last seven years on the uh, council in, town, uh, in the South Brunswick Township, every week, and the mayor's sitting here, uh, we get a packet that takes a good three, four hours to read through. And then you have to go out and sometimes in the field and look at things and try to understand things or call, call people like Arlene DeSena about affordable housing issues and try to get some feedback and try to understand. That's the job of any legislator. You have to be prepared. You can never vote or be told how to vote. You have to vote based again what I said earlier, what you feel you're representing the will of the people. And that's the other thing we do. You got to go out and talk to people, get feedback. Now these bills don't have to be passed in one day or one week. Now, my background in terms of 38 years of running a small business and seven years on the council and my whole adult life spending in different other uh, groups and organizations has prepared me with a strong business acumen and a strong governmental acumen. I know the process. I know how it works. I'm ready for it. And you have to be. You have to be committed. You have to know when you go down to this, take this job, you're spending and guaranteeing your life towards it. And my wife will attest to that. She never sees me as my family. So, you know, it, it's a commitment out of love. It's a commitment that was instilled in you when you were a child from your parents. And they, that gave you that work ethic and that commitment to service. I have it, and I hope to get the opportunity to serve it down in Trenton. Thank you. Now we've come to the final section of this program. And we're going to ask for closing statements. They can be up to two minutes each. And they will be in the opposite uh, sequence from the opening in terms of the parties. So we begin with Ms. Corfield. <laughs> well, first of all, I would again like to thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this event. Um, and I would like to thank my running mates and my opponents for um, a great debate and touching on a lot of really excellent issues. Um, I was listening to President Obama speak yesterday, and he quoted a little bit of Martin Luther King. And I'm going to paraphrase it because I was driving, and I don't want to, you know, write while I'm driving. That um, what he was basically saying, what Martin Luther King basically said, was that we can't be discouraged about the isness of the present. We need to focus on the oughtness of the future. And what is right now is a middle class that's suffering, a poor, uh, a poor class, a class of, of poverty that is growing, and people who are being forgotten in the economic recovery equation. The oughtness of the future needs to be one where people are respected for the work that they do, especially the people that keep this state safe and secure, keep our homes from burning down, educate our children, keep our government offices running. We also, there should also be an oughtness to general respect and dignity that is shown to all of our citizens, no matter how much or how little money they have in the bank. I hope to bring to Trenton 
my passion, my courage, and my creativity. I am very passionate about what I do and in any undertaking. I've already shown courage in confronting the governor about things I don't agree with as a private citizen before I became a candidate. And as an artist, I can bring creativity, right-brained thinking, out-of-the-box ideas. And I think those are good qualities for a candidate. Thank you. Mr. Camerata. Mr. Camerata. Thank you. Once again, I want to thank the uh, League of Women Voters. As usual, you've done a tremendous job. I want to thank the uh, audience. Your questions were thought-provoking, stimulating, and some were actually fun. I want to thank my running mates, and I also want to thank the professionalism of my uh, opponents. Uh, you, you guys are gentlemen, and I thank you for that. There's one thing I want to leave with everybody's mind in tonight is the concept of Trenton and what we spoke about earlier. Because Trenton is broken. There's a real disconnect. There's issues there that need to be corrected. And how do we correct them? Do we do it by sending someone down there because they have a certain political party attached to their name? Do we do it because once they get there, they committed to vote based on how they're told to vote? Or we do it because we know they need a job, so we'll send them down there to help them out. I don't think so. I think we need to focus on what really this job is. We need to send people down there that we be able to walk in a room, again, check their ego at the door, and sit down in a bipartisan approach and come up with real solutions, even if that means that four-letter word, compromise. <laughs> we have to do that. We have to represent the will of the people. We have to represent the middle class. Because what's happening is we're continuing to lose jobs. And if we lose jobs, we're going to lose the middle class. And if we lose the middle class, we're going to lose New Jersey. Jobs are a common denominator solution to most of our problems. That needs to be our focus. And hopefully, Tonight, you've seen some of the differences that we have, and hopefully you'll, be, you'll see that we need to send people like Maureen, Marie, and myself down to Trenton, and hopefully we'll get your support in doing so on November 8th. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Mr. Cittarelli. Thank you, League of Women Voters of the Princeton areas. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator, for serving. Thank you all for attending. Finally, I want to thank my wife, my four children, my wife and my daughter are here tonight. Their sacrifices make my public service possible. As a fellow taxpayer, I'm proud to say that my votes and accomplishments, achievements as Freeler have always matched my words. I have constructed budgets that have not, in my five years, raised taxes on Somerset County property owners. I have decreased county pers personnel roles by 12%. Through hiring freezes and workforce reductions, I've led the way in working with unions to reform worker benefits and institute wage freezes. And as freeholder, I've never accepted taxpayer-funded salary or benefits. And we hear a lot of generalities tonight about what we need to stimulate, do to stimulate the economy and reduce unemployment, but generalities won't get us there. We need specifics. And nothing frustrates me more than when politicians talk in platitudes. So I think all of us as voters, me included, what we need out of our politicians and our candidates for our office are specifics. As Assemblyman, I want to continue to make our state government smaller, less expensive, and smarter. I want to provide property tax relief by implementing a long-term plan that revitalizes our cities. That's the only way that we can eventually evenly distribute public school funding. I also want to work on consolidating towns and or municipal services, keeping in mind that it's up to each municipality Home rule defined is you deciding whether to consolidate with a neighboring town or to consolidate your services in regional-like models like other states do with their counties. Not until these reforms are in place can we solve our property tax crisis and expect the private sector to create jobs and grow our economy. Instituting these reforms will not be easy. It will be difficult, which is something I don't shy away from. I'm a successful entrepreneur and business owner because I'm solution-oriented, I'm not afraid to tackle big problems, and because I'm relentless about change. I firmly believe citizens deserve a different type of leadership these days. It's honest, determined, principled, and independent. And I'll so, continue to do my Mr. best Cittarelli. to distinguish myself in those ways. Thank you, moderator. We've been applauding. <laughs> Mr. 
Ms. Vela. I'd like to hold on to my thank yous and leave you first with an illustration. What I believe in and what we need in Trenton is something that you could all picture in your minds right now. Think of an eagle soaring, a big eagle. Everyone picture it. What this represents is this bird can only fly, like it or not, if it has its left wing and its right wing. We have to go to Trenton and work together. That's the only way anything is going to be accomplished. And we haven't been doing that. We're talking about reforms. Well, guess what? One side of a bird would make it fly in a circle if it only had one wing. We can't do this alone. People have, start, start, people have to start to compromise and come to the table. So th there's a judge that I used to appear in front of, and he always says when I walked into the courtroom in the morning to everyone in there, when everyone is equally unhappy, you know you have a good deal. Well, I know the poor is unhappy right now. I know the middle class is really unhappy right now, and we're hearing all about it. But is everyone else, or the few, are they unhappy? I'm not so sure. There's another saying that I always, I always love this one. And this saying is that when there's hope in the future, there's joy in the present. Well, guess what? I'm not so joyous right now, and the people of New Jersey are not so joyous right now. Where's our hope? I've thought about this for a long time, and you know what I know? Instead of having hope, we have an opportunity. This is the time to make a change. So I don't want to skip my thank yous. I do want to say thank you to the League of Women Voters. I really appreciate you hosting this event tonight. I want to thank my family, my opponent, and, and my running mates, of course. Without Joe and Maria, it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have okay. been such a great night. Thank um, you very much. I do much. ask for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Bates. Thank you. It's been my honor to serve in the State Senate for the past four years. And I'm proud to say that I have sponsored many bills into law, bipartisan, with Senator Smith and Senator Lesniak and Senator Turner. And I want to I want to give my opponents a reality check. Believe it or not, the Democrats have been in control for the last 10 years. And yes, the system is broken. We need to get more representation from our side to work with Governor Christie. I have um, been able to work, reach across the aisle and uh, work with key Democratic legislators in very important bills. And uh, I'm probably the only candidate or legislator that's been endorsed by both the business groups and the environmental groups. And that doesn't happen very often. And that goes to show you it's because I know how to work with the Democrats, because we have to have a bipartisan solution to these problems. What's wrong with Washington is they don't work together. But what we showed in June of this year, landmark legislation, it was bipartisan. It was Senate President Sweeney, Assemblywoman uh, Oliver, Republicans and Democrats alike, because they care about New Jersey and they, they know that there are incredible problems out there that have to be fixed. And the only way they're going to fix them is by coming together in a bipartisan manner. And I pride myself because I have a number of bills that have been passed because I work with the other side, because I, I put partisan politics aside, because I love this state. I, I want my children to live here. I want my grandchildren to live here. And the only way it's going to happen is if we can turn the tide and be, make New Jersey more affordable for everyone, the middle class, everyone. And I, uh, I, I thank my family. I thank all of you for coming out. Um, I've, I've dedicated half my life to being an elected official because I happen to believe that this is the greatest country in the world and this is a democracy that has its problems. It's not perfect. But if you're willing to put in the time and work together to try to solve the problems, we can make this a better New Jersey. And I thank the League for having this opportunity. I thank my opponents. I wish everyone luck. Thank you very much. You, you have thanked the candidates. They know that you appreciate what they've done. And I want to thank you, the voters. Your important responsibility is voting. Election Day, Tuesday, November 8. That's what we as voters do. We go to that booth on November the 8th. I personally am grateful for representative government and opportunities like we've had tonight. Thanks for sharing, and good night. Good job.